Hollywood, Hollywood. Good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome to this third webinar training on 10 Steps to a Smooth Pastoral Transition. Yes, we are ready tonight to get started. We are thankful for your presence. We believe that uh, tonight is going to be special. We believe that your mind is going to be challenged as we get into this session tonight. I'm so thankful for each of you being here. I praise God for you who have been following. I tell you that if it had not been <laughs> the Lord on my side, where would I be? So welcome, welcome, welcome. We'll give people a little chance to come on and get in. And uh, we're believing uh, God is going to send. He's going to send. He's going to send those that he wants to glean from this teaching tonight. And they're going to be excited about it. As we always say, we hope and pray that you will uh, show yourself. Uh, that you will allow the Spirit of God to rest upon you tonight. If you have been wondering about vision and about what it is to be a visionary, we're going to have a great time tonight. I tell you, this night is going to be epic in the life of the church and in your life. I believe it's a transforming word, a word in due season. So I want to thank you and welcome you to tonight's broadcast. We are excited. We, we're, just, we, we're just overwhelmed with the news about what God has done in the church through its servant leaders. And so we want to say to you, welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. To my guest and you too, welcome to you tonight. God bless you. We certainly thank God for you being on board tonight. To uh, Dr. Bingham, God bless you for being on board tonight. We're excited about what God is doing. And uh, if you're on with us, we pray that you will send me a note of encouragement. Send me a speak to me. Let me know that you're on the line with me tonight. Another few seconds, and we're going to be ready to get started. Again, we are teaching the series from my book, 10 Steps to a Smooth Pastoral Transition. 10 Steps to a Smooth Pastoral Transition. Uh, the first night we got acquainted, where I went uh, through a bit of my resume, a bit of my uh, background where I hope that you found it interesting background both in the military and in the church and the second session we delved into the steps on uh, last week we went through steps uh, one two and three and so I tell you uh, we had a great time on last week uh, welcome Marilyn good to see you on the call uh, it's going to be awesome. That's all I can tell you. We talked about the first three steps on last week. We told you how important it was for you to be prayerful. Spent quite a bit of time on that. If you're going to be a leader and make a smooth transition, work for God, you're going to have to be prayerful. And then we said to you that in your first year, don't just look, but be observant and informed. We introduced to you a system where you could get informed about what was going on in the church, even upon your initial 30 days of arriving. And then finally, we talked about being priestly and professional. In other words, being self-disciplined, having the emotional intelligence that would allow you to get through some sticky situations without losing your cool or your disposition as a servant of God. So we're, we're excited tonight. Uh, you know, we talked about uh, becoming more intentional and methodical and consistent 
in that first week. And now in this week's lesson, we're looking at uh, step number four, which believe it or not is be flexible. Be flexible. I wonder, have you learned, have you learned to have preferences rather than demands have you have you found the value of having a preference rather than always demanding things be your way if you're going to be a good leader you're going to have to learn that in certain situations you have to yield your demands to the preferences of those that you work with Tonight, we're talking about being flexible. Now, according to one of my mentors, Bishop Marsha Gilmore, it is a poor practice to bring a vision or proposal to your congregation where you need approval in that meeting. I'm going to say that again. According to Bishop Marshall Gilmore, it is a poor practice to bring a vision or proposal to your congregation where you need approval in that meeting. Wow. I'm ready to get started. Everyone is here. Let's pray. Father, I decrease that the Holy Spirit might increase. Speak through my vocal cords. Think through my mind. Father, your word is anointed. It shall never return to your void. It shall accomplish everything that you send it out to do. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. It is in Jesus' name I pray. All God's people said amen and amen. Now, Bishop Gilmore goes on to advise a pastor not to chair his or her own official board meetings, but to use those meetings as an opportunity for the members to discuss the proposals he or she wants to make in his or her absence. Then allow the person who shared the meeting, chairs the meeting, and the secretary to give him or her a report on that meeting. Plainly put, a pastor must be flexible and really spend time understanding the culture of the church he or she pastors. A pastor in transition has really not been at the church long enough to change the cultural dynamic in just 30 days or even a year for that matter. He or she must work within the constraints of the culture they find in place until enough interpersonal relationships have been developed, enough credibility has been developed, enough influence has been developed in order to move the church into another realm. In other words, you have to learn to hear the word no, maybe. How about this? Until you know your flock and your flock knows you. In those early stages, have preferences rather than demands as it pertains to church ministry. I told you about the incident in the first session with me arriving at Trinity Tacoa demanding a song. Well, I learned I should have never demanded the, T T the Tacoa Church family to sing that song on my first Sunday. I should have been flexible enough and allowed our relationship develop to develop without such pettiness. Be flexible. If you're going to make a smooth transition, learn to be flexible. In other words, you're there to serve the congregation. You're not there to drive the congregation. You're there to serve the congregation. And it takes time for you to learn your role 
in that culture, in that church? What have pastors heretofore been doing? How have they interacted among the people? Be flexible to learn the culture of the church where you have been assigned. Okay, step number four, be flexible. Now, step five, we talked about it in a separate video. I urge you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. That video is there. I urge you to listen to what it means to be consistent. But I will say this about it. Creflo Dollar preached a sermon one Sunday morning, and he stated consistency is the key to your breakthrough. Listen, when you show up, be the same person who showed up before. When you arrive on the scene, don't come as some person that you are not. Be consistent in your presence, in your professionalism, in your profile, in your words and actions. Be consistent. Become dependable. Let the folks know you. Don't always try to keep the folk guessing. Let them know who you are as a man or woman of God. And be consistent in those things that you are passionate about, that you are caring about as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hold yourself accountable to your own core values, standards, and policies, regardless of the pool of the circumstances that may cause you to waver. Be firm, dependable, and stable. Be consistent. And when you don't know what to do, Remember James, the moderator, who said, if any of you like wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Go to God in prayer. Ask God what you should do next. You have to learn to be consistent. Manage yourself. Lead yourself. You cannot bleed on the people. Manage yourself through prayer and fasting and seeking God's face. Then you will be consistent because a leader does not inflict pain. A leader bears pain. If you're going to have a smooth transition, you're going to have to learn to be consistent. I know a lot of pastors have compromised their values trying to appease the people, only to leave the ministry early because they forgot who they were. They lost their identity. They allowed other people to dictate who they were going to be and what they were going to do. I advise you not to do that. And whether you know it or not, your congregation will appreciate a strong leader who is unintimidated by objection and who handles himself or herself in a priestly and professional manner. We discussed that last week. Go back and review the video. Step five, be consistent. Step six, be methodical. Now, I've talked about this so much, you probably hear it in your sleep. But you must develop a method of operation that the people will learn your method of operation. Just as Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and these things will be added unto you. What Jesus was saying is see God's method of operation, God's method of doing and being, and imitate that. Then everything else you need 
will be given to you, will be added to you. When you do things God's way, God will meet your every need. So pastors, develop your system of operation and share it with your leaders and with the congregation. They know you're in transition. They know you've got to get established. They know you have to inculcate some things that they may not have experienced before. But when they do make those adjustments, they want to make sure that your method won't change from week to week or day to day. Be methodical. Have a system in place for when you meet with people. Have office hours for when you meet with people, when you uh, get with your staff, when you meet with those who are coming to you with needs, when you are going to various meetings and what is important to be on your schedule, what are your priorities, what organizational things do you want to be engaged in in the community? What groups do you want to be associated with? Get your system in place so your people will be able to follow and learn how you do things. That is so critical for them to know you because when they learn how you think, then they know how to move in your presence. Wow. That's a mouthful. Now, for those of you who bought the book, we're on page 26. We're talking about being methodical at the present time. But I, this is all groundwork for what I really want to discuss tonight that I believe is going to be such a blessing to you. It is this step number seven. Be visionary. Be visionary. Now I want to I want to delve in this a little differently than what is uh, printed in your book, but then that's why I'm teaching it <laughs> so I can do that and, and bless you. Okay, so when we talk about being visionary, we should first define vision, and I want to define vision tonight by the word of Almighty God. I want you to look with me in Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Let me pull that up. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. All right. There it is. There it is. Now look what it says here. I'm going to put that in front of me so I can look at you while I'm talking. Listen to what it says. And I'm reading from the King James Version. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me, talking about God, and what I shall answer when I am corrected or when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, listen, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Did you get that? Did you get that? Let me read it again. I'll read it from the Message Bible. What's God going to say to my questions? I'm braced for the worst. I'll climb to the lookout tower and scan the horizon. I'll wait to see what God says. Listen, I'll wait to see what God says, how he'll answer my complaint. What is a vision? A vision is a response to the questions that you will bring to God and the answers that God shows you to those questions. A vision is what you see. Emphasis on you. As a leader, John Maxwell teaches you should see further than the people you lead. You should have already gone where you're leading them to. You should have already seen where you're leading them to. 
what do you see? Because out of what you see, you will write the vision. You will write what you have seen in such a way that whoever reads what you have seen will be able to go there, will be able to follow. Now, listen, Habakkuk says, what is God going to say to my questions? I'm braced for the worst. In other words, God might not agree with your plan. God might not agree with your assessment. So you need to lay that aside and look to see what God will answer when you roll your plans before God. And if God just kills every plan you have, be flexible, be pliable in God's hand. Give God the right to speak into your situation and for you to obey what he says. Habakkuk says, I'll wait to see what God says, which means God speaks in pictures, picture words, visions, scenes. God shows what God is saying. And you have to be able then to interpret what God is saying by writing it down. That's powerful. That means you have to be prayerful in order to understand what God is saying. Joseph had a dream. He interpreted for the king. And the king said, well, since God showed you that, you be in charge of what? Carrying out that vision. Carrying out what God said to you in a vision. So a vision then, in its simplest form, is what God shows you God wants to do through you at that church and with that church during your tenure as pastor. So it may not all come at once. It may not all come at one time. It, however God desires to reveal the vision to you, that's between you and God. Okay? So that's the vision. It, you ask the question, or I ask you the question, what do you see? What is God showing you? Some will say, what is God saying to you? But God is going to speak to you through visions, pictures, circumstances, situations. God wants to speak to you about what you've asked God. And as a new leader, you should be asking God, what is my assignment? Not just the bishop appointed me. But what is my assignment in the scheme of your plan for this church and this community? Now, there's something else we can draw from this as well. Let us look at Proverbs. We're still defining the term vision. Proverbs 29. Most of you know this. You quoted it. Uh, verse 18. Let me get it quickly. Uh, verse 18. Listen to this. This is from the Message Bible translation. Then I'm going to go to King James. It says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. I want to say that again. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. When they pay attention to what has been written, to what God has shown, they are most blessed. When they do what you see, when they do what God has said, people are most happy and blessed. Now, let me read it in the King James Version, because King James takes us another way. I'll do that later. Thank you. Let me read this in the King James. Here it is. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. What is the prophet saying? What is the wisdom uh, prophet saying here? He says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. 
Now, the law and vision in this particular text can be interchangeable. So you could read it where there is no law, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. What do you mean, Reverend? Well, Dr. Griffin, tell the people what you mean. That if you follow God's law, God's word, and you keep God's law and God's word, you're going to be happy. But if you rebel and refuse to obey God, you're going to fade away. That word perish means fade away. You're going to just cease to be relevant, cease to be uh, influential. You're going to lose your place. You're going to just fade away. So then when we delight ourselves in God's law and we follow the law of God, we are going to be blessed and happy. And that's what makes a vision so powerful and so important. When we respond to the vision that God sets before us, we know what we're doing. We know where we're going. Now, we don't always know why, but we always know what we're doing because it is God who has shown us this vision. We have written it down, rolled it before God. Any ad adaptations that need to be made, we do them as we walk. We don't sit in the boardroom and scrutinize. Once we have the vision, the Bible says that they that run, that they might run. In other words, they may get busy fulfilling the vision. You as a pastor, you as an, a, an auxiliary president must be able to set the vision before people, make it plain to them so they can obey it and find joy in doing it. Wow. Look at God. And so then, step seven is be visionary. Now I want to teach from another perspective I've told you about. Uh, not long ago, as one of the teachers at the Louisiana Annual Conference, I taught from the subject, leadership that renews the local church. And there are some transformative things that I want to grab from that teaching for the next few minutes because it's important that you as a leader are able to communicate your perspectives and your interpretation of who the church is and what the church should be. It comes from a book written by Howard E. Friend. It's entitled Recovering the Sacred Center, Church Renewal from the Inside Out, published by Valley Forge Press. I recommend you buy that book and delve into it. It is, it is an exciting and transformative read, transformative read, okay? But let's go through a first a couple of things about this because you have to answer these questions if you're going to be successful as a leader. How can you transform your church? Do you use the strategies of growing from a tadpole to a frog or a caterpillar to a butterfly? Now, the tadpole changing into a frog represents what we call incremental change, organizational change. It's planned and orderly, and you can see it right before your eyes. You do it by in the church by training, renewing your policies, establishing a leadership team that thrives under leadership change uh mechanisms that's one way you can do it the caterpillar changing into a butterfly however is more chaotic because you can't see the change yet you've got to believe that despite what you see 
change is occurring. They call that faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You believe this because of the message that you have received from God, and that is God sent you to this church. Therefore, you believe that because Jesus loves you and because Jesus sent you there, he will not send you somewhere where change is impossible. You accept the appointment with the understanding that you have a mandate from God to do great things, to lead that church everywhere it needs to be. But you can also, if you're an effective leader, use both. Some things you will see develop as you lead your church. Other things will remain invisible until they just pop out like the caterpillar turning into a butterfly. You will be preaching and preaching and preaching much like uh, Ezekiel to the Valley of Dry Bones. And you won't see any effectiveness for a season. But then suddenly you'll begin to hear and see your church coming together, being unified, working on one accord. Things are moving, things are progressing. The momentum has changed. And now you see the hand of God at work. That takes faith to be consistent, to be flexible, <laughs> and to be the visionary. Takes faith. And any organization that you lead, you're going to have both types of organizational change working for you if you really apply these 10 steps to a smooth pastoral transition. Now, though things may be chaotic, though you may not seem to have a handle on people and programs and processes, you really got to have faith that God is somewhere in the mix, that God is working these things out for you and for his glory. So then you have to understand what your personal credo is about what the church should be. What do you see as the purpose of the church and how would you define an effective, vibrant church? What leadership system or infrastructure did you inherit when you got there? How does your church operate? Does it operate like the tadpole or like the caterpillar? Now, here's a key question in this assessment of your leadership. Are you willing to change and become the servant leader that the church needs in its own context rather than your own? In other words, must your church conform to you or are you willing to conform to the culture and the past administration that you inherited in order to serve the church? Is your way or the highway your mantra? Or are you seeking to be a servant leader? Seeking to find your role, your place of influence in that body of Christ. Humility, humbleness, Finding your niche and thriving in your niche as the under shepherd, as the pastor, as the president of an auxiliary. Those are good questions. And I want to go a bit further. How you see the church, how you see the organization will determine your leadership style. Do you see the church as an organization 
or an organism, as an institution, or as a body that will determine your approach to ministry. And it is going to be vital for you to know how you perceive the church in order for you to grow and fit into that church in such a way that you increase the church's value and you don't take away from the church's value. Now, let me give you some concepts from this reading of Friend's book, Leadership That Renews the Local Church. He talks about having the view of the church as an airline or an airport. What do you mean, Dr. Griffin? Well, an airline tries to influence as many passengers as possible to travel on their airline, to go where they are going, to travel to the destinations they have selected. They're not concerned about where you want to go. Their only concern is recruiting people who will go where they're going. Now, you can look at this as a method of inclusion and exclusion. You exclude those who don't want to follow you. You include those who do. Simple as that. You may be having an airline mentality about your church. You may think that that church is supposed to do exactly what you ask it to do and no one else should have an opinion or a recommendation. And as an airline, you can only go so many places. You can't grow a church with an airline mentality because that church will only grow as 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 large as your mentality, as your mindset. But perhaps you may be one who see the church rather than an airline trying to get people to heaven. Maybe you see the church as an airport. <laughs> What's the difference? An airport creates an atmosphere for several airlines to operate. And an airport has what we call air traffic controllers, class leaders, boards and auxiliaries. These are the air traffic controllers within a church. And what they do is they control, not control rather, they, uh, yeah, control, they direct, if you will, the ministries in the church to make sure that all of them are resourced to get to the destination they are trying to reach. But the church serves as the central place, the hub where the word of God is preached, the sacraments are administered, people are healed, saved, and delivered in congregational worship. But when they're out doing ministries, we have people like the director of the Board of Christian Education, the uh, lay leader of the church, et cetera, the ministry to men who are on different airlines doing different things. And the church does not fold because you are sharing power, because you are allowing others to be in charge of the ministries that God has equipped them to be engaged in. And you cannot be a micromanager, you cannot be a dictator, and then be at the head of an airport. You've got to trust the leaders around you. And so, Pastor, you've got to learn to trust your leaders, to trust that once you have cast the vision, made it plain, and everybody understands it, that those you have selected, because you are involved in the selection of leaders in the church, then they're going to stick to the vision, and they want to reach the vision in quick fashion and do it in such a way that they will be long-lasting, durable pursuits. So what is your concept as a pastor? Are you there to organize the people, to supply the people with the material resources that they need to be good stewards, to carry out the ministries of the church? 
without you necessarily having to be at every one of their meetings, having to be making the decisions at every turn? Do you have your methods in place for how decisions are made, for how the board meets and discuss and determine which direction they're going based on the priorities of the vision? Are you, as pastor, a pilot of a particular airline, Webster Parish CME Church? Or are you the pastor of an airport, Webster Parish Airlines Incorporated? Yes, how does your church function? Now, the airport may seem more chaotic. The airline will be more uh, incremental because everything comes through you. But I believe you got to have a mixture of both. And I believe that as a pastor, if you want your church to grow more uh, past 100 or 200 members, you're going to have to adapt your leadership style to fit that of an airport. Or maybe not. Let's look at a pottery store. Pottery store or a pottery workshop. A pottery store sells pre-designed pottery. Customers must choose to buy what is offered or else go to another pottery store. Some churches I've seen like this. They have one ministry, by God, that's all they got. That's all they want. They don't do it no other way. These are the ministries we've had since we were founded. And if you don't like it, go to another church. They're quite blunt. They have the mindset of a pottery store. You come here, you hear the gospel, you are baptized, you are saved, you come to Bible study, you come to Sunday school, you sing in the choir, you may usher, you may join an auxiliary, but this is all we got. We don't have daycare and children's ministries and youth ministry. What are you talking about? This is what we have. And either we don't even have nurseries on Sunday morning. So if you if this doesn't suit your family, go on down the street. St. Rest or, or St. Tree Bob, they, they got everything you asking for. We don't, and we're not finna change for you. We This is our pottery store over here. Some pastors have that mentality, and so do some members. And then you may be a pastor who see your church as a pottery workshop. Now, workshop has the basic fundamentals that I just mentioned, and, and they offer it, but it also affords customers the opportunity to create their own. They allow new members orientation classes. They allow new ministries, uh, divorce support groups and mental health support groups to, 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 to come together under the umbrella of the church. They allow, you know, singles ministries and, and family ministries and all different food, food distribution ministries and, and uh, utility support and all of these kind of helps ministries the church offers for anyone who's willing to get it started and operational and commit to it and do it in excellent fashion. The pottery workshop mentality says all are welcome to use the spiritual gifts and the talents that God has given. And pastors, if you want to have a smooth transition and you want to see your church grow, you're either going to be as an airport mentality or a pottery workshop mentality. But if you want to stay small, then you'll do the airline and the pottery store. But I've got one more. I think you can relate to, and that is a baseball team or a baseball league. Now, baseball teams play on a field or someone else's field. The team leaders concentrate on getting as many players in the game as possible, pinch hitters, base runners, backup pitchers, and the like. The object is to win the game. That's what the team wants to do. That's all their focus on is to win the game. That's all they manage. That one objective of the baseball team, the Atlanta Braves, is to win the game. 
But what about the league, the baseball league? Focus on getting as many games as possible on their fields. Because they're a league. One team won't do anything for them. The use of the field is 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 more crucial than the players engaged in the games. In other words, they don't want their church to sit closed Monday through Saturday. Nothing happening at the church until Sunday or Wednesday evening. You know, in, in the league, only a certain number of players can play on one team, but because you have a field, when you have more players than authorized, you can start more teams. You can play more games. The object is to keep the game going with as many different teams as possible. Youth, young adults, children, missionaries, lay. Keep the doors of the church open. Tutoring programs, mentoring programs. Open your concept of what the church is in today's society. But you have to have an understanding because based on your leadership style, perhaps you've never had this type of conceptual imagination of your role as a leader and as the pastor. So you can be an airline, you can be a pottery store, or you can be a baseball team to do your uh, incremental organizational change. Or you can do transformative change by being an airport, a pottery workshop, or a baseball league, or you can combine the two. Pray over it. Think about it and see what God says to you. Finally, are you a specialist store or a mall, which is similar to what I just said about the baseball team and the baseball league? Specialty stores are really smaller than the malls and the stores in the mall. But the mall is made up of all kind of stores. The mall metaphor is more like a connectional church. CMEs, United Methodists, African Methodists. It's got its first churches, its flagship, its mother, its mother liberties and such. And it also has a lot of smaller church. All under the same umbrella. All doing various ministries. And they're all supporting one vision. Specialty stores are concerned about what they're selling. But the mall opens its doors for all types of products to be sold. And our connectional church, I believe, has opened its doors for all types of ministries to move forward with their blessing. I think there's a place for all the gifts and graces of God in our connectional church. And if you're going to make a smooth transition, I want you to be able to imagine your church in this great mall called the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Find the products that you're going to be offering to your community. And I dare you to investigate and you will find that the CME Church has resources, mentorship, and training that will help you be effective. Now, we're talking about the different types of concepts of what a church is, but uh, I want to say a word about the preacher, and then I'm going to pivot because I only got a few more minutes left. Let me ask you this question. Does your preaching produce logical results? The sowing or reaching, reaping paradox. I sow here, turning the soil, planted in straight rows, watering and weeding. Then I watch, time passes, and something catches my attention out of the corner of my eye. I see buds and blossom, flowers, fruits, and vegetables over there, an unexpected harvest. That's that chaos model we talked about, about the caterpillar 
and the butterfly. Nothing happens if you don't plan. But don't expect what you plan to necessarily happen. That's that incremental change. You can plan all you want. But that doesn't mean what you plan is going to happen. What did we say on last session? Roll your plans over before the Lord. Give God a chance to tweak your plan. And then if your church had a name, if you were going to write about your church as a human being, as a person, how would you describe your church? What size would it be? How tall will it be? What would its conversation be, its language? What would its heart be? What is the heartbeat of your church? What one thing your church is known for throughout the community? Describe your church as if it was a human being and ask yourself, would you like to be associated with that person? Exactly. Exactly, Marilyn, you, you're right about it. Yes, yes, yes. You can plan all you want. That does not mean that your plan is going to work or even come to fruition. People sometimes just won't support your plan, won't show up to show you any support of your plan. However, that does not mean that change is not taking place. They may be in caterpillar cocoon stage and you just can't see how it's working in your favor. So you've got to know that if you're going to make a smooth transition, you require faith in God. You've got to believe that God is with you on your new assignment. You've got to believe that you're on a divine appointment with that church and its membership. You got to believe that God gave you something to leave with that church. That God has uniquely gifted and equipped you. You may not have felt it when you got the appointment, but between appointment time and preaching time, you should have been quickened in your spirit. That you're right where you're supposed to be. That God has given you a charge to keep. And you're going to make the best of it. So rise to the challenge. Be a visionary, step seven. Be a visionary. Understand the culture of your church. I want to thank you tonight for rocking with me. I want you to know that the church needs leaders who can rise to a formidable challenge, laced with danger and rich with opportunity. Leaders who are self-transcending and self-motivated, inspired and inspiring. And as Bishop Teresa Jefferson Snorton said, leaders who will be bold, face now, embrace next, and see new. If you do that, I can assure you that by the time you leave that church, you will have made a mark that cannot be erased. You will have seen the hand of God at work and you will have been blessed by your visitation. All right. We'll talk more next time, next Thursday. I'll be back. We are going to discuss these last remaining steps. and We're going to conclude this session. Then I'm going to do something different. But step eight is be self-motivated. Step nine is be confident. And step 10, be successful. That's going to conclude our session. We'll be back next Thursday. Thank all of you for being on the call tonight. Thank all of you for rocking with a brother for these 50 some minutes. And I trust that you have learned quite a bit. and You've been given much to pray on and to think about. 
God bless you. God keep you. Remember, I'm available to come and do training where you are. Local church, doesn't matter the size. All you need to do is contact me and let us set a schedule, set an appointment where I can work with your leaders, your lay leaders and your ministers to add value and perhaps make your job as a leader simpler and easier. But it's all, it's all about the mind. And if we can influence their mindset, we'll influence their actions. God bless you and God keep you is my prayer. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.